Good afternoon from sunny Barcelona and welcome to a new Food for Rhino webinar. Today it's about Shape Diver. Uh, you probably know it already, but Shape Diver is an online platform for hosting and sharing Grasshopper files on the web. It's widely used by thousands of designers around the, around the world, uh, so they can share their parametric models via configurator with other non-technical people, and it runs on any web browser. And uh, today we have the pleasure to have with us Edwin Hernandez, uh, project manager and lead parametric designer, and Ezequiel Lopez, uh, head of marketing and sales. They will give us a guided tour through all of the new features recently added to, to, to the latest version of their plugin. And from new import and export file formats, uh, new plugin supported, new attribute systems, and a plethora of new components uh, to download and update via Rhino's package manager. I mean, you can install Shape Diver through Food for Rhino or through Yak. This is the new package manager found in Rhino 7. Uh, welcome, Edwin uh, Ezequiel. To the audience, remember that there is a chat uh, that you can use during the webinar. Please feel free to, to place there your questions, your feedback. And during the last 15 minutes, uh, I will pass all of your questions to, to Edwin and, and Ezequiel. Also, this webinar is being recorded. So in case you miss a part of it, it will be available right after it finishes on this same link. So if you need to do something in the, in the middle of the webinar, I mean, we, don't, we are not telling you to miss it, but you, can, you will be able to watch it later. So Edwin, uh, Ezequiel, many thanks for being here and the screen is yours. All right, thank you very much, Carlos, for inviting us to your channel. We're really excited to show uh, the latest version of our uh, plugin for Grasshopper. Um, as you mentioned, you know, we released it recently, a couple of weeks ago. Also, a couple of months ago, we released the first version or the, the latest version of our, of our online platform. Because remember, Shape Diver is, is multiple products. We have uh, the platform, we have the plugin. And um, a couple of, uh, I think about a month and a half ago, two months, we did another webinar where we focused entirely on the platform. Today, we're going to focus entirely on the plugin. So the actual plugin that you need to install on your uh, Grasshopper for you to start using Shape Diver. And obviously for this, we have Grasshopper Maestro here, Edwin Hernandez, who will show us all of the latest uh, components. We um, included the changes, the differences that, that it makes uh, this version with the previous ones, like new imported file formats, export file formats. Um, I think uh, we prepare a really, really cool example that should, uh, you know, ring the bell with, depending on what you do with the product design architecture, I think this, this example has it all. Um, and I think we're going to have a forum post on our own section, no, Edwin, uh, where we're right. going to share the Grasshopper file we're going to show today, and we're going to share the link to the Shape Diver model um, that, that anyone can use uh, uh, to, 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 to do what we're going to show today. All right. Nice. So, also send, send this also please to me because I will add it to the description of the of the webinar on YouTube so that people can can also find it there. Absolutely. Perfect. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, Edwin. Let's get started. Perfect. Let's get started. So uh, Ezekiel already did enough intros, so I will jump in um, to what we're gonna check today. So basically this is what we call the infinite pavilion. Uh, this one was a model that was created, uh, was designed actually for by one of our colleagues here uh, in Shape Diver, one of the project teams, team members called Michele Farina. And then I just did some tweaks here and there so that we could showcase all of the new things that um, Shape Diver offers. So um, this is where we will get. But of course, we need to check um, the Grasshopper file that is behind this model. So here we are in the Shape Diver model. We will also share this link in the description so you can also check it out. And if we go to the Grasshopper model, basically this is how it looks like. Uh, so we have a section for create 3D model, create texture in his model and prepare for exports. So let's get started with the plugin. So the plugin is divided into different sections. So we have the input sections, output sections, display, textures, uh, images, etc. To begin with, we're going to start with the inputs. So in this case, the inputs are located all in the black groups. That is what we call the um, parameters here. And we can start with the first one, which is the path. So basically, these panels are organized through a path, a path that is basically a curve. 
Now for local testing, we have these uh, points here where we can um, directly in Rhino start to move this, this path around and see um, how it changes in, in life. Um, and we can also import some files to be able to shape this uh, to shape these uh, panels into different forms. So because um, Shape Diver doesn't have an out of the box way of dragging these points, you can do it via our API, but if you don't have the API, then you can instead provide your users other ways of providing this information. So let's say that you are an architect and you want to create this uh, pavilion with all of these panels, and then probably you are a user of um, AutoCAD or any CAD software which normally can, is able to produce a DWG file or um, the Excel file. So through this component, which is called the import geometry component of ShapeDiver, we are able to import all sorts of formats. And now here, for example, we have an example with a DWG file locally. So we are going to test it locally um, in our machine, which is just this S. And we have uh, this other example in a DXF file, which is this shape. Uh, but uh, this is what we used to support. So we used to support just DXF and OVJ formats for the import of geometry. But from Rhino 7 onward, now we are able to support pretty much all the, um, all the file formats that Rhino itself supports. So if we, Rhino, if we double click in this import component, then we get this um, window. And then here we can see all of the formats. But basically, this is just all of the formats that Rhino itself supports. So let's say that you are not an architect, but you are a designer. So probably you don't use AutoCAD or any of these software, but you may use Illustrator. Then I have here an example of Illustrator, just the happy face, but of course it can be whatever you want, it's just Illustrator. You just save it as an Illustrator file. And now I can import this Illustrator file inside Gasshopper through the ShapeDiver plugin. So now I have here the Illustrator example, if I connect it, and then I have to change the scale. So let's go to 50. That's too small. Let's go to 100. Ah, then it was 1,000. <laughs> Let me check. There you go. Then you are able to import now this in Illustrator. So basically, here we just have the file. And as an output, we get all of the curves. So if I check this, uh, these are just all of the curves imported through Illustrator now. Of course, I have this parameter to control the scale because then the, the, the uh, Illustrator file is imported as it is. So if, it's, if it has a very small scale, then it will show like that in Rhino. So you will have to set some extra parameters for that. Um, so let's go back to scale one and let's go back to this DXF example. So this is one example to import, um, for example, an Illustrator file. Then here we have some parameters for the panels. We will not focus on that, but it's just to change the panel width. So how, how much distance there is from here to here and other parameters. But these are just regular parameters from Grasshopper. Again, panel rotation, also regular parameters from Grasshopper. And then if we go to the pattern, then we have other imports format here, also with the ShipDiver plugin. This is the uh, import bitmap. We already had this. So basically you can import uh, PNG, um, GPJ and in other formats. So again, you can double click on it. If we check the window, we get all of the formats that are um, available as a image format. And here we get a bitmap as an output. So here I have nothing connected, but let's connect this example. And now we have that map, that the pattern now is mapped in our wall, in our infinite wall. Um, let's go for this other example. And then you can see how it maps. And then here as an output, we just get this uh, bitmap, which is also something that you get with the Grasshopper plugin. So this was developed by the Grasshopper plugin. So when you download it, you will automatically get this new format, which is the bitmap format. And with that, you are also able to use the um, Shape Diver Squid plugin. So the Squid plugin already existed, but we created a version that is compatible with Shape Diver. That allows you to edit these bitmaps and do all sorts of um, all sort of uh, editions, all sort of use Grasshopper to edit uh, bitmaps. 
So in this case, the only thing that I'm doing right now is just um, tiling this uh, texture around the pattern, around the wall, but we are gonna do a little bit more afterwards. So we come here now to the next section, we have the logo section. And now here again, we have another example to import geometry. So let's import this um, pattern, for example. And then we get that, but we change the scale. And if we change the offset, then we will get a, a nice result at the end. So we get this result, but let's say that I want this to actually be um, something for marketing for a company. So for example, here we have the logo of Gucci and here all of these files are SVG files. So now you're also able to import SVG files. So as an input, we get an SVG file. As an output, we get again, curves. And you can do with those curves whatever you want. In this case, we are blending two bitmaps in one. The bitmap of the pattern, the background, and the bitmap of the logo. And with Squid, by Squid Ship Diver Edition, we can join both of them together. Um, then if we change Giga, for example, for this Gucci, we're going to go back. 0.5 and we're going to separate them so it's 0 0.5 of the height and we're going to separate them so we get something like this and we have a final example which is the nike logo but for this nike logo let's use a different pattern for the background where we are going to use this one and that's it this is these are just urls that i'm using for testing so you can either send a URL or you can send the file itself. Um, that's the logo section. And then we have something called the enhancement model. So just a model that we want to place somewhere in the scene. In this case, now we have two new formats as well that we're gonna show here. So one is in a sketch, sketch app and another one is a FBX file. So we check this a sketch app model. And this is just, uh, person uh, scale model so we can have some sort of uh, size here so we can have some some sort of sense of the size of of it that i just downloaded that uh from the sketch app warehouse so if we come here i have it open here so i i mean sketch app is pretty well known and they also have a 3d warehouse where you can download lots and lots of models directly so i can just come here and download but i could just, I just need to sign in but then i will have the option to download these sk pay uh, sk pay files so that's what we get here and then in that way i can now blend two softwares into one i also have another example here which is this nike as fbx uh, this one i need to give it a different orientation because normally fbx and rhino have different um planes uh, to start with. So I'm just gonna change to XZ and the scale, I'm just gonna make it also bigger. So let's go for a hundred, that's too big. So let's go for 10, yeah. And then we have these uh, Nike shoes. And where did I get this FBX file? I got it from Sketchfab. So that's another well-known um, uh, platform, Sketchfab. And here are the same, they have plenty of models that you can download. And now you can download that as FBX file and get it directly into Grasshopper through the ShapeDiver uh, plugin. So now I'm able to import here all of those formats. So now, so far we've checked um, uh, we've checked DXF, DWG files, we've checked Illustrator files that now we can import. We've checked PNG. GPJ, all of these uh, bitmap formats that they were already available. Uh, we have SVJ format and way more. So you can continue exploring all the lists that we have. That is basically the same list that Rhino has. And then you are now able to import all of those formats here inside Grasshopper. Um, so that's the new part that we have of the input section. The other parts were already available. This import text was already available where you can input text and get it inside um, inside uh, Grasshopper. The bitmap we check, the geometry we check. Now, if we go to Shape Diver, how does that look like? So here, what we get 
when we um, when we put this import geometry component is this option in Shape Diver. You just click on it, and then it will show you this window so you can just import uh, whatever you need to import. You can also import it as a URL. It has to be just a publicly available URL, but you have here the option. So every single time you put that import component, that's the option you will get in Shape Diver. So anyone now is able to send these files um, to Grasshopper through Shape Diver. That's the part of the inputs. Now let's jump to the outputs. So in the outputs, the main difference is that now we're able to um, give more options to the exports. We have also new exports, but we have also new options to add. So I have here in the export section, I have the old ones just to show you how it used to look if some of you are already um, ShipDiver users. Then we used to have just data, so any data that you want, just a file format. So you should just give us here as a text which file format you want. So 3DM, SCL, et cetera, and the name of the file. But this was very limited because then you are not able to really give more details of how do you want these files to be exported. So for example, a DXF file, it has lots of parameters that you can um, adjust to be able to export it exactly as you want. So in this case here, we are gonna export the 3D model. I just need to activate the exports here. Go through. And then we can export this 3D model as a, check is loading, as a DXF. You can export this 3D model as a OBJ. Uh, so let's check it here. So we have the options here, even 3DM. So 3DM is here, so you can export back to Rhino, but you will be able to do it through ShapeDiver. And you can even give the, the version of Rhino. So this is an option that you have. Then for example, here we want to export in OBJ. And we have again, lots of options here, end of the line. We have here, for example, export objects as OBJ groups. So that means when we add naming inside each of our meshes or geometry, now we can group it. Before it was not possible to group in OBJ, it was everything together into the same mesh. Now you can group it. Um, if we go to FBX, then we have also lots of formats here, uh, file format, normals, and map Rhino Z to FBX Y. That was what we saw in the in the um, inputs that it was flipped. And finally, we have here the 3DS export, which doesn't have any options in this case. But every single time you put here any of those formats, so let's try again with uh, OBJ format. Uh, there is OBJ export options. If I put it here, it automatically creates these um, inputs. So you can decide, so you know which options are available. For example, here we have three options. Do not export object names, export objects as OBJ groups and et cetera. And the same here, we have three options as well. And every single one that has options, more than one, it will tell you which options are available. Let's go to 3DM. Now 3DM is just the version. Um, let's go to the next example so you, we can see more options. So here we have uh, exporting the texture. So now we are exporting the 3D model, then we export the texture. So here we have just the format and also the quality as an option. And here we're exporting just an image. Then we can export the CAD drawing. So in this case, uh, we are gonna export that DXF or DWG file. And what we are gonna export is all of these laid down on the floor like this. And um, and we have plenty of options. The DWG DXF format is the one that has, I think, the most options. So it's the one that says drawing export options. And if we check it here, then we have all of these options. If you want to export meshes, solids, the format itself, of course, uh, if you want to export lines as what, curves as what, arcs as what. So all of these is there available for you to change parametrically. And finally, here we have the export PDF uh, option, which is something that we had already, but here we have a very good example, which is able to export every single, um, every single print that we have here into a DXF, into a, PDF, uh, into a PDF, sorry. So by using Squid, so this, I'm right now in the PDF example, by using Squid, I'm able to create this bitmap, this image, which 
uh, well, actually in this case, not a, it's not a bitmap because we are exporting it as, as a PDF. So I'm, I have actually here readable text that I can select. All of these done through the script uh, components. And I have here, for example, the floor plan of how my panels will be laid down, how much degrees will be in respect to the path and the ID of it. And having this floor planner, I also have all of these, um, let's put it into the entire screen, all of these, every single page that I can print um, through, uh, I can just print and cut. So here we have all of them laid down and separated. So you can just go into production if you need to um, print and cut these, these pages. If I, Zoom in, then we can see that at the end of the, each of the pages, we have the ID. So you are able to recognize each ID with the floor plan. All of these, uh, thanks to the exporting of the PDF in a parametric way. And I could also import this back into, into um, Illustrator. So for example, here I imported this one back. I just drop, drop this uh, PDF exactly here. And I, here, I have here all the information that I need. I have the bitmap. I have the page, you can see it here in white, that is gonna be printed and I have all the cures. So the PDF is, it stores all the cures. So now you can continue, if you need to continue in Illustrator editing, then you can continue editing here. So as an input, you are giving me an Illustrator file, but as an output, I can also give you an Illustrator file. It's a PDF, but pretty much you can import it in Illustrator. Um, so those are all the export options uh, that we have. There is more export options, of course, and all of them have their settings. So that's what we have here for the uh, outputs. And now let's move to the display. So for the display, we start, we have three options right now. The first option is the traditional one. So that's pretty much what has been so far, uh, what, how ShapeDiver has worked. So here I have the old component for materials. Uh, this component had less options in the inputs. And here we have the new component that is down here. So for example, as an input in the old component, we had just metalness, metalness as a number. So you can define whether uh, if you put here zero, that means it's completely non-metallic. If you put one, it's completely metallic material. But uh, we were not able to select, we had to select either the number or a texture. So you can also test, send a texture map where you define how this metalness uh, happen. However, with the new component of, of the ship tire material, now you are able to divide both of them. So for example, here we have um, metalness map as a, as a texture, as a bitmap, but we also have the metalness as a number. So you can now combine both. I can send a metalness map and then through shape diver, I could start to, um, to level to adjust how much metallic my, my object is. The same happens with the roughness. So we have the roughness as a number, but also the roughness as a, as a bitmap. So you can also adjust it through the number um, based on this image. The same happens with the opacity, opacity, opacity map. And the normal map, um, bomb map, they were already there before. Um, so this one is the is the new shape diver material component, and this one is the preset one that we already had before. This one you basically give a color, and we have a set of presets that you can use if you don't want to think about. Uh, oh, if you don't know how to create materials, you just use a preset. If you want to know all of the presets that we have available, you can go to this link that I have here. We, as as I said, we will share this uh, model in um, in the YouTube channel um, below in the description and also probably in the forum. So you will be able to explore all of this yourself. But here we check quickly these materials. Then you will be able to see all of the ones that we um, offer. So let's go quickly. Yeah, there you go. So you have here the materials that we offer and you have a complete list with the code that you need to provide. Okay, they still so, need to do the texture mapping. Correct. That's a good point. Yeah. Even if you have a preset, you still need to have texture mapping. Texture mapping is just how the texture will grab around your geometry. No, that can be done through human. The human plugin provides uh, some of these texture mapping options. Uh, but yeah, that's always, you need always to have that. Otherwise, the image doesn't know how to display in the, in the geometry. 
Yeah, we, we have a tutorial is... in our blog yeah. and we'll link it. We have a tutorial on texture mapping. So we'll, we'll link it in the, in the, in the description. I'm just gonna disable this one and go to the next part that I think is the most exciting one, in my opinion. Uh, now we have new components for display that are able to support um, GLTF files. So GLTF 2.0 files. So now you are able to get all of the, all of the um, geometry as a GLTF format. That means that anything that you can do with a GLTF file, now you can do through Shape Diver and through the Shape Diver plugin. So that comes with two new components that are also here, the GLTF 2.0 material and the GLTF 2.0 display. So here in the material, it looks different to the other one because it has way more options. So for example, here we have a um, base color, which also does the one of uh, opacity map. We have here also a metallic, metallic roughness texture. So we are, joining both of them together. I mean, GLTF 2.0, join them together so that you can um, optimize the amount of files that you have to load before we had a metallic texture separate from a um, roughness texture. So that means two images that you have to load. Now you just need to load one, one which combines both. Um, we have other options here, for example, uh, the type of um, alpha mode that you want. So if you want an opaque, it's completely opaque. So you don't have any transparency. If you, have a, if you want a blend, that means that you are gonna use the color, the color uh, alpha uh, channel to be able to uh, graduate, to be able to adjust how much uh, opacity this material has. And finally, you have the mask option that is the one that we have right now here. So the mask option uses the same color uh, map, the same color, base color texture to be able to apply the opacity. So if I use the squid um, quick preview component, then we can see how this looks like. So we can see that here we have this kind of wood, that is what we have here, but we also have all of this transparency. And this transparency is grabbed, is taken directly from this one. So we don't need an opacity map anymore. Both of them exist in the same bitmap. And all of that is, 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 is set through the mask. And then additionally, you can have some adjustments. that is this uh, alpha cutoff where you can adjust how much of this opacity is actually taken. And finally, we have this double-sided. So double-sided, that means whether you are gonna, if I see a surface in the viewer, whether I will, I will be able to look at it from both sides or just, or, or just from the side where the normal is looking at. I will show an example in a bit to be able to, to check all of these ones. Um, so, if we go here to the output, now we have the display component, which is taking all of this geometry already with all of the textures into the same one. So here I have all of them into the same display. And now if I right click on it, now I'm able to save the GLTF 2.0 directly locally in my machine. So you don't need now to even use Shape Diver if you don't want to, to be able to take uh, advantage from it. So right now, a GLTF 2.0 file is, is supported by lots and lots of viewers online. Much, almost all viewers support GLTF 2.0. So if I save this, um, now I will be able to see this in any other viewer, even also the viewer that uh, Windows itself bring, bring by default. So I have here, um, I will be now open in this file locally. So I have here all of the test files. And now if I open this one that I just produced, directly here in the 3D viewer that, the, that Windows offers, now I'm able to also display all of these uh, geometry. So here we have with all of the textures, all of, all of them are there. So what happens if I bring the light down? So let's bring the light down. I want to show you something. So if I bring all of these down, you can see that the logo gets very dark. And how can, we, how can we prevent the logo from getting dark? Let's say that we want to put some lights inside these panels so that the logo is all the time uh, shining. How do, we, how do we simulate that through this 3D model? And that's through emissive maps. So the GLTF 2.0 now is also able to, to support um, emissive maps. So parametrically, we are creating also an emissive map, which is basically just, um, a black and white uh, texture as well. 
which of course the whiter it gets, the more um, the more um, emissive it is. So all of the logo here, for example, is white and everything else is, is black. So that means that when, an, when you have an emissive map, everything that is white will not be affected at all by the light, by shadows or by anything. So I will just connect this here, export it again and see how that um, looks. How is the, the difference? So I'm gonna save. Yes, yes, and let's open it again. So here you can see that it's completely apart. And if I open it again, now we should be able to see the logo all the time keeping its its uh, whiteness. Let's say it's uh, it's it's real color. So if I if I reduce all of these intensities as we did before, all of the lights, and you can see that the logo keeps its intensity because it's emissive. You see, even if I go completely dark, the logo is always shining. So now we are able to support all of these emissive maps as well. But here I'm just using the, um, the local viewer of, of, uh, of my Windows machine or my Windows computer. But I can also use any other viewer. If I go online, uh, you can just type GLPF viewer and you will get many of them. So here I just have an example one. I just drop this here. Remember, this was created just through Grasshopper and, and the, um, the ShipDiver plugin. And here we have it in any other viewer. So now you can create all of these GLTF files and then use them wherever you want. Even here we have an example. Where, you, where we have uploaded this GLTA file to a Sketchfab. So now you are able to even bring to Sketchfab all of your models. So you could iterate, create lots of these models, create lots of these GLTFs, and then use them as you wish. Um, yeah, so this is for the part of the GLTF display. And we will move to the last part where we will include the, also this uh, next way of displaying. We'll just, uh, no, we'll leave this one like that. And the last part is here and is the attributes. So this one basically affects everything that we have looked at that affects, the attributes affect all of it because the attributes can help you to interact or to interact even more with your geometry, to extract information and to insert information into your geometry. So how does that look like? So let's go from the beginning. So let's, let's start with the inputs. So how can I use attributes in the inputs? Well, here in the path, if we go to the path, um, here we have this, uh, this import. And when we import this, we're importing a DXF file. A DXF file normally contains uh, lots of information, contains layers, contains colors, um, contains names, etc. So through this component called the uh, extract attributes component, which I have it here, uh, extract attributes and then deconstruct, sorry. So here, if I enable this one, I'm extracting the attributes from the geometry and then I'm in deconstructing them. So I can see all of the information that this file is bringing in each of the geometry that I'm importing. So I'm importing a layer, I'm importing some colors. So you can see the keys, keys and values. So in the keys we have layer, color, plot, color, plot, weight, material. And here if we go to values, we get all of the values in respect to those keys. So I'm using right now these ones to extract the layer mainly. I could use everything, but in this case, I just want to concentrate on the layer. So here I'm accessing the key, the key layer. And in that way, I can know whether I'm looking at a path or I'm looking at a model location. So the model location is here, this point. Sorry, this point. That is the one that I'm using to display the 3D model of enhancement that we call. So if I use, uh, let's say another one, for example, this one, then we'll be able to, this one extracts two points. Forgot to, to disable the export, so that's why now it takes longer. We always disable the export or all the export because that's what takes the longest to compute. I will disable that after we finish. So. I just come down here, I say process exports false, so that everything computes way faster. And here we have two points. So if I would like to just uh, show, for example, the, um, 
the other model that was uh, the person in let's say I have two scales models of a person and where I want to show it is given by a point let's go x y and let's go scale one so when we extract here we have in one side the paths all of the paths are here and on the other side we have the two points so this is just a, again a dwg file that i'm bringing and it has metadata that i can extract through the attributes through the extract attributes component through the access key component and through the deconstruct attribute component so that's in the inputs so now now we are able to extract more information from our um our geometry now let's go to the outputs so what can i do in the outputs to take advantage of these um, attributes uh, component. So in this case, what we are gonna do is, let me go back to the original one, so this one. And here, what we will do is, we are gonna input information in our geometry. So instead of outputting information, I'm gonna input information in it. So if I process the exports again, Load. Now we will be able to input here. So if we go, for example, to the export 3D model, now I can input information like rotation. So I'm here saying, okay, I have these frames. I'm moving them around in the space. And then I want to start the rotation, how much rotation these panels have. And that is done through the add key value per component. And in this case, I'm adding a rotation with some numbers. And that's just added as a metadata inside the mesh itself. The same happens here. I'm using this component called the uh, export attributes component, which use, this, which use the same uh, logic. So I can input inside my geometry for example the layer that i want it to be in the export i want input I, I i can input the color that i want it to be name plot color and plot white weight so all of these ones i'm i'm additionally adding the rotation and then i'm putting this inside the geometry the same happens in the next one so in the next one i want also some layer color etc and the next one the same layer color etc and now here i can um, get all of these data, all of these meshes, but now enriched, full of data, layers, colors, etc. Let's check this example. So here we have this example already open, and this is just I just extracted it directly uh, from the from the model, and here we can see that we have two layers, path zero and path one. So everything, of course, is working. We have everything with their respective color. And additionally, you saw that I add this rotation um, rotation attribute. Where do, you, where do you use this rotation attribute? Because it's not layer, it's not color, it's not any of that. Well, this rotation attribute, it's added as a, um, as a user data. So if I put here, get user data in the command bar here, get user data, I say all keys, then I have here rotation and I get the information. So I can put, all of the attributes that I want, there is some reserved ones, like the layer one, because of course it's going to be go it's going to be used in the layer section. But any other that is not part of the of the software where you want to export, then will be added somehow in a different way. In this case, as a as a um, user data that you can extract anyways. Now, how did I get this file here? Well, just by right clicking here and exporting locally. This is something new also that we have in the exports. Before you were not able to export locally. Now you are able to export uh, locally. So you don't need also um, directly the Shape Diver platform to be able to export, but you can now export also inside um, Grasshopper. Then if we, get, if we go to another example, for example, the export code drawings, same situation. I could also export this locally if I want. Remember all of this also you can export through Shape Diver, but you don't need to explicitly. And then here uh, we are also adding some layers. We are also adding some colors, etc. And just to show you that it works in any software, I have here this is just a CAD viewer, a DWG viewer, and this is what I export. Export all of these lines, 
and all of these curves. So the blue ones is what is interior, the red one is what is exterior. And additionally, I export the floor plan. Why? Well, let's say that I want the floor, so the floor plan is also in different layers. So floor plan path zero and floor plan path one. So if I unhide it or show it, just for you to see that everything is organized in layers. And let's say that I want to use this, uh, this DXF file to project with a laser in my, in my site. So I go to my site where I'm going to construct this pavilion and I can use a laser uh, to be able to know exactly where my panels will be positioned, for example. Uh, that's something that one of our clients do, by the way. <laughs> okay. Um, that's another example. And then the PDF, well, in the PDF, we don't really need to put any attributes. So it's mainly for this one where we are using geometry. So that's another part where we use attributes. But finally, we also use attributes in the display. So in the display, we are now, in, we are now putting the uh, material not through this input. So before you will use this input, which is also for the material, you can still do it. But you can still, but you can also send the material attached to the geometry. How? Again, with the attributes. So here I am putting the attribute material, and I just input also the material, the SD material, a uh, shape diver material inside my value. So I can now insert this material inside the geometry. But additionally, here I'm also inserting with this component called the attached transformation component. I'm also attaching transformations. So you saw that before I was transforming directly in Grasshopper with the transform component so that we have it here. Um, so we have just the uh, geometry and then we just use the normal transform component to be able to show the geometry in the right uh, location. So here we have it. But that's not the most efficient way of doing it. The most efficient way of doing it is actually if it's equally, if it's the same, same uh, material, uh, the same geometry all the time, then why don't we attach the transformations instead of sending all of this geometry? So that means right now I have this back panel, which is just a square, a rectangle, sorry. And then we just attach the transformations, but we still get one single mesh. So now we're sending one single mesh plus as metadata 56 transformations. So that when we get here, the only thing that we are sending is five meshes with enriched with information. And the same, uh, that, that is different to what we had here, no? Here instead, we would be sending for each of these ones, uh, well, you say it was 56, I think. Uh, yeah, 56 meshes. Now it's just five meshes and rich with information. Um, so we attach the materials, we attach transformations. And finally, we get to this one that is the final way of displaying information. And that's through the output component. So if I enable, sorry, disable this and enable this one, then we have our last component that we introduced that is the output component, shape diver output component, and it's here, outputs, shape diver output. And this one gives you a new, a new way of displaying information that is through uh, attribute visualization in shape diver. So what does that mean? Well, now I'm here adding some layers. So I have my geometry um, here of the back panels. I am attaching several attributes. In this case, I'm, trying, I'm attaching three attributes, the material attribute, uh, the layer attribute, and I'm missing one. And yeah, I think that's it. Uh, ah, layer, material, and rotation. So I'm, I'm attaching three, three attributes for in this case. And how does that work in Shape Diver? Well, now you are able to access just through this component. You need to use this component. Then you are able to access this data directly in the Shape Diver viewer. Before you were not able to access layers, you were not able to access um, any um, custom attributes, like for example, rotation, but now you are able. And how does that look like? So if we come here and we go to the, to the final example. Now we have here this, this option here where you can go from the standard visualization to the attributes visualization. So if we go, if you do that, and then we come here to this tab, that is the attributes tab, then we have all of the layers that I, I have assigned in with, with the attributes components in Grasshopper. So 
So for example, here I could say, okay, the frames are gonna go red. So I can see now all of my red frames. The back panels are gonna go, for example, I don't know, another color and so on. Uh, let's go ground and I'm gonna go for another color. But additionally, I can also hide all of these um, all of these layers. So that's why you have a slider, not a toggle, because you can hide them gradually. You, like you, you bring the opacity down up to the point where you just dis you just make it disappear. And in that way, you can now interact with the layers and colors inside um, Shape Diver. You don't need any external application. You can do it directly in Shape Diver through these components that I show you. And finally, what happens with this rotation one? You know, we had this rotation one, that's not a layer, that's not a color, that's not anything. That's a custom attribute, the rotation. Well, we have here attributes, and here we have this rotation. So if I click on it, now I'm able to visualize custom attributes um, here in the viewer. So for example, I'm here just trying to visualize how, how much rotation these panels have. So the whiter it gets, it's, uh, the more rotated it is, and the darker it gets is basically zero. But we can also change the way it gets visualized. So let's go blue red, and then we can see how um, these attributes are being visualized. We can see that the minimum is zero, the maximum is 90. All of this is extracted from the grasshopper file and then displayed here in a custom way for you. So that's all for all of the um, new components that you have in grasshopper, the new ways of visualizing. Um, it's a lot of information in a very short period of time, so I, I wish I had more time to explain you more in detail, but yeah, we are ready for the questions that you may have. Excellent, great presentation and so many new things since the last time I, I, I saw it. I mean, I, I think it's amazing the work we are doing with Shape Diver and the new platform. And yeah, I guess we can organize in the future a new webinar, maybe for developers or for people that want to embed or have their Absolutely. own. Absolutely. Yeah, actually, I mean, we I... have we have one planned in about two to three months. It's going to be an API showcase. So, uh, I mean, right now we've shown uh, what you can do with a pure Grasshopper plugin, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But there's like you can it's an order of magnitude more powerful if you involve our API. And that's the next webinar we're planning. It's 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 a it's, it's a big challenge because it's it's a lot of things and and it's meant for for developers, right? Because uh, you need to know a little bit of web development. But that's the next one that we're planning. Actually. Great. And if I if I don't remember it wrong, uh, if someone wants to create their own website with your application with uh, the Shape Diver uh, application, there, I mean. You can also help them on that, right? Or you have some experts you can recommend yes, them to absolutely. embed so, everything. Exactly. So I mean, we we have a, a, a um, all of our paid plans include a very simple way of integrating Shape Diver into a website via an iframe, which be the mm -hmm. same way YouTube allows you to integrate a video onto your website. Super simple. In less than one minute, you can add a Shape Diver viewer into your website. Mm -hmm. uh, with our even with our most affordable plan, which starts at forty nine euros a month, you can do this. Right. So we already give you the attributes. We already give you the UI. We already give you even AR. We didn't have time to even show AR. All of that is included with the forty nine. Right. And then as you go. On with our paid plans, you you get you unlock more powerful features, right? More computation time, API access, and all these type of things. But that's exactly what we want to uh, uh, show in our in our in our next webinar. Perfect. Okay. Um, but 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 yeah, anyone today can create obviously a free account, uh, Shape Diver. You can try almost. Or most of these things. Some for, 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 for some others, you might need to start a trial, right? So we also offer trials. You can start a trial without a credit card. So you mm -hmm. can start a seven-day trial, a 14-day trial, and then, then you unlock absolutely everything, right? And you can test everything that uh, Edwin just showed today. Great. I already pasted on the chat uh, some of your clients and case studies found on your website. Perfect. Uh, there are people congratulating you for, for, the, for the platform. Some All people right. asking also where to learn Grasshopper. I also pasted some links there. Because, uh, yes, excellent. For sure, yeah. if you want to create a nice definition, well, a, a nice project with Shape Diver, you need to know Grasshopper exactly. or hire a Grasshopper expert. But there are so many resources today on the on the website to learn Grasshopper. And yeah, 
Michael Opitz says that the attribute visualization is really fun to play around with. So many options. Try it out yourself. Um, He's actually the developer of the viewer, so he can say a thing or two about the okay, viewer. Okay, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Self-promoting. I don't yes. know. Are there any questions, audience, for Edwin right. and Ezekiel? So maybe when, if while well, well, people ask questions or not, like we do help companies with high complexity grass devel uh, grasshopper development, right? So okay. we have a bunch of tutorials. I think Edwin is showing the our 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 YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, we have a bunch of tutorials, mostly focused on optimization, right? Optimization. So, okay. Uh, the, 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 you know, when, when you're executing a Grasshopper file online, uh, optimization counts a lot. Uh, when you're running a Grasshopper file offline, you can use, you know, a certain type of, of, of techniques that are expensive, you know, like, like solid differentials or, or, or uh, these type of things. But on online, you must use a lot more efficient processes. And mm -hmm. sometimes we, sometimes the, the easiest way would do, would be to use a, 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 um, one of these more, more, more expensive processes because it's always so simple to do, but sometimes we have to do, you know, something that's double or triple the complexity, but to yeah. shave 80% of the speed, right? So that's very important. Yes, of course, in the beginning, you need to, when you start experimenting with Grasshopper, you just look for a solution, but later optimization is exactly. very important and coding. Exactly. Yeah. At the beginning, if, when you're ex exploring an idea, it doesn't really matter how you get to the to the idea, right? Yeah. But once you're ready to, to transform it into a, into a production file, right? Mm -hmm. in, 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 you, you, then you need to change your your complete approach. No, and that's what Edwin really specializes here. So there there are. I think we've been doing videos for about a year, and I think when the pandemic started, that's when we started getting a little bit serious about videos, <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. we started. Edwin is really uh, uh, showing his philosophy on how he does grasshopper de development, right? So there's, there's, there's a couple of great, great, for example, the, the one that says, how do I, how I keep my grasshopper definitions organized? That was mm -hmm. one of the first uh, videos where Edwin really started sharing how he keeps grasshopper running fast, efficient. And then from there, we just started, you know, uh, exploring all, 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 all the different op optimization methods we use while working with clients, right? So that's part of the things we, we, we do, share most of our knowledge for anyone who wants to tinker with Grasshopper. Sometimes, you know, it's high complexity projects, they, they need our help and we obviously can provide that help, especially That's in AC. Right. Um, yeah. we, 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 we specialize quite a lot. Um, nice to know because many times uh, there are some companies or individuals asking us for, for help. And of course we try to help them as much as we can, but if it's a, a complete or a full project, we need yes. to forward them to some other external experts. Yeah. And actually, right there, the third video to the right, that's the last webinar we did that was entirely focused on the platform, right? So the platform, so if you, if you jump into the platform, Edwin, just real quick, we completely rebuilt it from the ground up uh, and, and launched it. So we started the beta, pro, the beta program like in October, November last year. Mm -hmm. We invited about 30 super users that we had that really helped us bring it to the level where it is today. And then we officially launched it around, around the end of January. So it's been live for about two months and we've been, you know, like releasing updates and improvements every now and then. And now we, we, we really like how it's looking, but obviously it's always a, a work in progress. No, it's never finished. And there's always That's... updates. So actually, if you go, Edwin, to the help.shapediver.com and then the platform release notes. So this, this in, in, in this upper right corner, you can see all the updates that we've released uh, uh, on, our, mm -hmm. on, our, on our platform. You can see May 5th, April 25th, uh, when was two point, uh, the, the, the other one. So we're trying to keep a cadence about, about two, three weeks. Uh, okay, that, that was a bit longer, two, two three weeks more or less uh, between, between releases. And there you can explore all the updates we've been uh, adding to, to, to the platform. Nice. Also the, the plugin also has its own release notes. <laughs> Uh, so uh, when, if, if someone wants to check out, you know, like uh, the, the latest features, they're right there. Yeah. David Alejandro Acevedo Vieira says that, yes, please organize a webinar to show how to embed um, a definition or a, on, on a website. Yeah. And then he also says that you have the best of the template for Grasshopper. <laughs> yeah, that's addition. That's Edwin. Yes, to organize to organize uh, al uh, all the algorithms. And there are no more questions. Don't be shy. I mean, 
<laughs> you have the experts here. Right. Uh, no, yeah. I mean now one there is one question by Casey Stam. Are there any current tutorials for the workflow of exporting to VR or AR instances in the Shape Diver viewer? Mm, yeah. No, for specifically, I mean we have we have some explanations written, but video explanations of how to do AR. Well, the okay. AR, I mean, maybe maybe you can go to one model, Edwin, and we can show real quick how to set up. Go to edit. Yep. So when you upload a model to grass of a grasshopper model to Shape Diver, our system will automatically check it. No, you, we will read all of your parameters, etc., and then we will output this online application, right? And then here on the right hand side, when you're in edit mode, there's these viewer settings, and then there's this AR section. So if you click on AR. Right mm -hmm. there, you can decide to disable or enable AR. Obviously, in order for you to view it in AR, you have to have a mobile device with AR mm -hmm. capabilities. But almost all modern phones and tablets are, are have AR capabilities. So you have to enable it, and then you have to tell the viewer how you modeled this, the units in which you modeled this 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 model. Right. Okay. So in this case, you have to tell it if you click on the drop down menu, Edwin. <coughs> Uh, you basically need to tell the viewer whether you use millimeters, centimeters, meters, feet, inches, or custom. So you can actually be, you know, you're showing a big building, you can do a one to 10 scale to show mm -hmm. it on a desk. No, so then here, for example, the model was modeled in millimeters, I'm assuming, Edwin? Yeah, so, right. here, so that's why here the height of each panel is 3.5 meters. Exactly. So this is a bounding box. So this number would tell you if it makes sense. Now, if it makes sense that, okay, is my model is really 3.5 meters high? Yes. Okay. Then it's millimeters. Mm -hmm. no? And okay. then you basically, you save it. And then uh, uh, actually, I mean, we're going to save it and we're going to make it as a public model. Uh, and anyone with a mobile device will be able to go to this URL and we're going to share it on the forum. And okay. with a mobile device, it, maybe you can go to developer tools and simulate a... Um, a mobile device just for them to see the the the, the button yeah. but when 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 you're on the mobile device an additional button appears inside the viewer that says ar right and when you click it on a mobile device that will immediately trigger so here That's we're right. going to show you mm -hmm. it'll switch so we will output so that what we did is we, we we output ar compatible file formats and in this case, you see the AR button there. Obviously, if we click it, nothing's going to happen because we're just emulating a mobile phone. But with a mobile phone, you're going to be able to click it, and then the AR viewer of your mobile device will open immediately. And whatever you, would see you the were background, viewing, the background, this on top of the background, yeah, exactly. But you are seeing with the watching with the with the mobile, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, for, for this model, you will need to go to the park or something. Yeah. Of course, it's a huge model, no? But can if you, you have can a very you... small model, you can test it out. Like we have plenty of models. Again, if you go to just to the main website, shipdiver.com uh, slash app. All of these models are smaller and mm -hmm. you can you can just click Put on it, on table. they are, and you will be able to see it in a table. And all of that, remember, all of that in the and background. Can you change running, the size running, in the mobile application? Uh, well, I mean, or you, you need, have to go to- or as you, you said, you need to yeah, uh, first in shape give it, diver, it in advance. First in Shape Diver, and then you mm -hmm. click AR, you view mm -hmm. it if you want to change the, the size. You close the AR viewer that brings okay. you back to the Shape Diver. You, shape diver directly. you change it in Shape Diver and then you export it again. Okay, in that's good so, to know. That's good to know yes. because the scale, of course, is very important, and sometimes you can do it in the yeah. in the mobile itself or not. There and is this also is free. one, and this is free. So even free accounts have access to AR, that's... right? So everyone has access to AR. One more comment this time by Danilo Franco Gigantelli. Mm -hmm. I notice a difference of light how the new engine works. That's a good question. So, I mean, it's not really an issue. It's a matter of <laughs> setting it up uh, correctly. So let yeah. me, uh, if I can open this. I paper. guess, I think Danilo, it's better if you can send them an example file because it yes, depends I mean, on if, so many factors. If you yeah. created a model with the old platform, save it with the light settings of the old platform, those settings won't translate correctly. As far as I understand, <laughs> when those settings won't translate directly to the new viewer. So mm -hmm. you basically have to open the old model in the new platform and re-edit the lights. Re-edit mm -hmm. the lights, okay. Correct. And the materials as well? or well, No, ma materials are set directly in Grasshopper. Are there Perfect. Yeah, so just lighting. So here we have, a, in, when you go in a bit mode, you have a tab for lighting. But also for everyone to know, not just lighting is important, <coughs> but also the environment map. So if you mm -hmm. come here, the environment map. So here mm -hmm. I have, for example, uh, we have lots of here that you can use. 
This mm -hmm. must also affect how the light goes because it's basically is is where the model is sitting. So if I show here, I put here as an environment map like a studio. Nice. Yeah, so now that Rhino Seven, you know that we support Adobe Substance materials. Are mm -hmm. these compatible also in Shape Diver? Mm, I don't think so. I, I haven't. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, maybe, maybe, that. maybe not directly. Maybe Michael uh, Optis in in the chat can answer. I think he's watching because he's a developer, he's our viewer developer. But what we did add that is different from our old platform is these HDR environment maps. Okay. Right. So these HDR environment maps are like 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 uh, very um, uh, um, like the, the lights are are uh, uh, thrown into the scene very uh, evenly. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead of having to choose spotlights to you know very like have to be very precise. Basically, the whole environment is emitting light. Yes. Right? So here you can see how, how this environment map is important to have it correctly because here, if I go here right now, I'm sitting in here. So all of the light of this room is, is going inside my model. So I have to choose a very good light uh, uh, environment to be able to also show the best uh, of your model. Perfect. Yes. Okay, many thanks. We, we have, unfortunately, we, we have to leave it here. But I want to thank you again for a wonderful webinar and okay. hope in a few weeks or months we can do a new one, this time maybe Absolutely. more for, for developers. Yes. And to the audience, also many thanks for, for watching this webinar. Remember, it's being recorded uh, and available on this same link. And yes. stay tuned for, for the next webinars. So thank you, everyone. Have a nice evening or a nice day, depending on, on where you are located. And see you soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.